Hello, my name is Peter Lawrence, and I'm pleased to introduce the May issue of the Journal of Vascular Surgery, Venous and Lymphatic Disorders, and highlight four outstanding papers which are freely available for the next two months. The CME article for this issue is entitled Predictors of Intracranial Hemorrhage in Patients Treated with Catheter-Directed Thrombolysis for Deep Vein Thrombosis by Lochler and co-authors. Although acute intracranial hemorrhage is a rare complication of catheter-directed thrombolysis, the incidence and clinical predictors de of developing hemorrhage in the setting of, of thrombolysis are not known. Using the National Inpatient Sample Database, all patients with proximal lower extremity or vena cave of deep vein thrombosis between January of 2005 and December of 2013 were evaluated. Among 188,000 patients with proximal lower extremity or cable DVT, in patients treated with anticoagulation alone, the hemorrhage rate was 0.2% compared with 0.7% or almost three times that level for those undergoing catheter-directed thrombolysis. Predictors of hemorrhage in catheter-directed thrombolysis were a prior history of stroke, chronic kidney disease, and age of greater than 74, and male sex. Our next article, Prospective Comparative Study of Different Endovenous Thermal Ablation Systems, for Treatment of Great Saphenous Vein Reflux by Carathanos and co-authors compared three different thermal ablation modalities used to treat Great Saphenous Vein Incompetence. In 153 patients, the GSV occlusion rate at one year was 93% in the radiofrequency ablation group, 93% in the laser, and 95% in the laser uh, with a jacket group. The authors concluded that all three modalities are equally effective in the treatment of great saphenous vein reflux, but the 14 nanometer radial fiber showed better early postoperative pain scores. The clinical and quality of life scores were similar in all three at one year. The third article, this issue's editor's choice, is a retrospective comparison of thrombectomy followed by stenting and thrombectomy alone for deep vein thrombosis in patients with May Thurner syndrome, with the lead author, Dr. Huang. In patients with proximal DVT, 372 patients had their DVT secondary to May Thurner syndrome. 221 received a thrombectomy with concomitant stenting, while 151 had thrombectomy alone. Stenting added about 15 minutes to the procedure, and it had a slightly higher venous perforation rate. The patency at 36 months with stenting was 74%, with a secondary patency with other additional procedures of 92%. The authors concluded that the addition of stenting is effective in proximal DVT, secondary to May Thurner syndrome, both early and late. Our final article, Propofol Administration During Catheter-Directed Interventions for Intermediate Risk Pulmonary Embolism is Associated with Major Adverse Events by Sherfan and co-authors from the University of Pittsburgh. Between 2009 and 2019, patients who had propofol during procedures were compared with those who did not. 340 patients received catheter-directed interventions using standard and ultrasound-assisted thrombolysis, as well as suction thrombectomy. Propofol was given to 11%, while 89% received midazolam with fentanyl or morphine or hydromorphone. Patients who received propofol had a significantly higher adverse event rate of 14% versus the others with 4%. The authors concluded that propofol should be avoided due to its detrimental effects. Thank you for watching. For more information, please follow us on social media and remember to like, comment, and share. We hope that you enjoy these four highlighted papers and the other excellent papers in this month's Journal of Vascular Surgery, Venous and Lymphatic Disorders. 
Remember that these articles are free to read until the end of June. And thank you for your attention.